Sertino Poulter Institute. So Carly Sertino Poulter is the director of the ARC Advocacy Network at the ARC of Indiana. She oversees the advocacy programs around the state, working on public policy, increasing opportunities for self-advocates, educating self-advocates on employment options, and helping families navigate various government programs, connect to community resources, and solve problems. Carly is a graduate of the Indiana University Bloomington School of Journalism, which is now part of the College of Arts and Sciences and the College of Arts and Sciences Political Science Department. Through her work at the ARC, Carly sits on several committees, boards, and commissions, including the Statewide Transition Workgroup, the Supported Decision-Making State Plan Workgroup, the Indiana State Adult Guardianship Task Force, the Family and Youth Empowerment Team, and the Marion County Reentry Coalition. She also sits on the Indiana Alliance for Prenatal Substance Exposure Board of Directors. She works closely with state agencies to help families navigate various systems and to ensure policies are self-advocate and family-friendly. Most importantly, Carly is the mother of a 22-year-old son with autism and anxiety who is growing into an incredible adult and a 15-year-old son with ADHD, depression, and a wicked sense of humor. This experience as a parent gives her a unique perspective for input with government agencies and allows her to speak with families as a peer who experiences many of the same situations that they do. Welcome, Carly. Thank you so much for being on our webinar today, and I will turn this back over to Jill. Good morning, everyone. I just want to make sure that you remember to use either the QR code or the tiny URL that has been posted in the chat box. If you have any questions, please feel free to either put them in the chat box or in the question and answer box. I would like to point out that there is information in the chat box on no, not only the tiny URL, this also gives you information on our archived webinars, how to contact us, and how to find a um, special education liaison in your area. I've also posted in there uh, lifecoursetools.com, and this is also another tool that you will be able to use that Carly will be discussing. At this time, Carly, I'm going to let you take over and thank you again for doing this and welcome. Well, thank you so much. And, and Jill and Lisa, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to talk today. Um, and, and thank you to InSource for all, all of the wonderful uh, things that you guys do. I, I know that, you know, even, you know, when my kids were, were younger and, and we were dealing with school issues, I would absolutely turn to InSource. And so uh, just you're a wonderful organization. And thank you so much for inviting me to come talk with you guys today. Um, and, and as Lisa was saying, you know, it, you know, yes, I, I'm the director of the ARC Advocacy Network, but just as importantly, especially for something like this, I'm a fellow mom. You know, I, I live this life every day, and I, and I think that it makes a difference because when you live it, when you live it, you understand things in a different way. And, and so, you know, as we're talking about Medicaid waivers today, by all means, ask whatever questions you have. You know, it, I think it does help to talk to people who have lived experience. Um, and, and, you know, at the same time, if you have success stories, if you've got, you know, things you want to share, by all means do, but also recognize that, that um, there are other people on the webinar. So, so be a little careful about um, what type of personal information you share. But let's go ahead and, and get started today um, talking about um, Medicaid waivers. So if you will bear with me while I share my screen. And you know what? I forgot to do that ahead of time. Hold on, I need to stop sharing my screen because the bar is always over the slideshow. Um, so let me fix that now. All right. All right. So today we're going to talk about Medicaid waivers and we're going to talk about the life course framework, which is something that the Bureau of Developmental Disability Services is using with all of their clients. And I, I remember when, when my son was young and he was first diagnosed with autism, people mentioned something about Medicaid waivers or, or maybe they just said Medicaid. And I thought to myself, oh, we have health insurance. We don't need that because I was naive. <laughs> so, um, you know, 
one of the things that, that I experienced is that you know, people will hear about Medicaid waivers, but nobody ever bothers to explain what a waiver is or why it's important. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about the different waivers that are available in Indiana, what their purpose is, what they, what they do, and then how they can actually impact um, your loved one's life. And as I said, if you've got questions along the way, go ahead and put that in the chat or in the Q&A um, and, and we'll talk about those things. Um, I'm with the ARC of Indiana, and if you're not familiar with the ARC, we're an advocacy organization specifically for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. Uh, but we've been around since 1956, so you know, just a little while here. Um, but we are also, um, we, we do a lot with um, legislation and public policy when it comes to people with disabilities. We are home to the ARC Master Trust, which is the state's largest pooled special needs trust, which is a way that you can set money aside for a loved one uh, without jeopardizing any of their social security or Medicaid benefits. But we're also the founders of the Erskine Green Training Institute in Muncie, and we're part of the ARC of the United States. So let's start with the, with the most basic question. What in the world is a Medicaid waiver? Well, a Medicaid waiver is, is what um, we in Indiana call our home and community-based services. That's the official title um, in, in federal um, policy is home and community-based services. And it's a combination of those home and community-based services and Medicaid health coverage. Um, and those home and community-based services are often the types of services that aren't covered by health insurance. And they're designed to help people stay in the community. That's their whole purpose. And the big catch here is that family income is not considered. That's how most children are able to have a waiver. That's how my son was able to have a waiver is because when you have a Medicaid waiver, it changes a lot of the Medicaid financial rules. And one of the biggest ones is that when a child is under the age of 18, they don't look at family income or family assets. They only look at the child's income and the child's assets. Now, um, the individual has to have um, has to have fewer than two thousand dollars in resources because that is a, a Medicaid requirement. But I'll be honest, there should be a big neon flashing asterisk next to that two thousand dollar limit because there are all sorts of exceptions to that. So, for example, if your child has a five twenty nine account uh, because you've been saving for college or for some um, you know some educational expense, guess what? That is not counted as an asset by Medicaid. If you have an ABLE account, if you have a special needs trust, none of those things are counted as assets by Medicaid. So, so you can have money in there without counting against that $2,000 asset limit. And then there are all sorts of specialty accounts as well, but that gets us in the weeds and I don't want to get us off track. But here in Indiana, we have two different types of Medicaid waivers. Um, we have waivers through the Division of Aging. Those are our skilled nursing waivers. And with, within that, we have the um, Aged and Disabled waiver and the Traumatic Brain Injury waiver. And then we have waivers uh, for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Those are through the Bureau of Developmental Disability Services. People will often call that the BEADS office for short. So if you have been furiously trying to Google BEADS, the first thing I will say is we don't talk in words. We speak in alphabet soup. So, so we tend to abbreviate everything. And the other thing I will say is don't apply logic to government programs. The, they don't like to work and play well together. But the Bureau of Developmental Disability Services or the BEADS office has two different waivers. There we have the Family Supports Waiver and the Community Integration and Habilitation or CIH waiver. But let's start by talking about those division of aging waivers. And I know it sounds really strange that, that we're talking about kids and here I am talking about the division of aging and talking about something called the aged and disabled waiver. But I will be perfectly honest, with the aged and disabled waiver, there is no age limit. There are literally babies who are on the aged and disabled waiver. But those division of aging waivers have, um, have a very specific focus. They're really designed for individuals who have really high medical needs or who have some uh, pretty significant physical disabilities. And these waivers are designed to help people stay in their homes and not go into a nursing facility. That is their purpose. So a lot of those services tend to be in the home. Um, they, they tend to be um, more, more about physical support. Um, 
And for some individuals, that's exactly what they need. Now, in order to qualify for the aged and disabled waiver, you must meet nursing facility level of care. Um, but that's also a whole lot easier than, than a lot of people realize. Then they also have a traumatic brain injury waiver. And in order to qualify for the TBI waiver, you must meet nursing facility level of care, or um, it's called intermediate care facility for, into, for the intellectually or developmentally disabled level of care. That's a big mouthful, um, uh, but it's ICFDD level of care. And you must have a, a diagnosed traumatic brain injury. And the state of Indiana has a very specific definition for that. In order for it to be considered a traumatic brain injury for these programs, there must have been some outside force that caused the brain injury. So for example, somebody got into a car accident, um, somebody, um, somebody was hurt in some way, that would be a traumatic brain injury. But if there was a brain injury that was caused by, say, meningitis or, or some sort of, um, or a stroke or something like that, while those are brain injuries, they are not traumatic brain injuries. So it wouldn't qualify for this uh, particular uh, waiver. Um, and, and to apply for the Division of Aging waivers, you have to call your local area agency on aging. If you're in the Indianapolis area, for example, that would be SACOA. If you're in um, the Fort Wayne area, that would be Aging and In-Home Services. Um, up in the South Bend area, that's Real Services. So, so there are a lot of different um, area agencies on aging throughout the state. And to find out uh, yours, you can either Google Area Agency on Aging Indiana or call one 800 986-3505 um, and, and get to them that way. So the other nice thing about the Division of Aging Waivers, there is not a waiting list for the aged and disabled waiver. So if you have a child or a loved one, because again, this can go for any age. If you have a loved one who has some pretty significant medical needs or pretty serious um, physical disabilities, you may consider talking with the Division of Aging to see if that may be an appropriate waiver for your loved one. Um, but we also wanna think about, you know, what is the purpose? Um, what, are, what are you wanting out of these waivers? Because they have radically different purposes. So the Division of Aging waivers are designed to help people stay in their homes and not go into a nursing home. The BEADS waivers have a very different purpose. They are available to help people with intellectual and developmental disabilities get out and be as active in the community as possible. So um, these waivers are designed, like I said, for anyone who has an intellectual or a developmental disability. And an intellectual disability is, is an actual diagnosis. Um, it, it means that you have an IQ of around 70 or below. And the reason I say around 70 is, is there's always a little bit of a, of a margin of error. Um, so, so a little plus or minus there. So if you have a child who has an IQ of around 70 or below, that's actually an intellectual disability and that could qualify you for this waiver. Um, but as I said, these are designed to help people with intellectual and developmental disabilities get out and be as active in the community as possible. Within there, we have the family support waiver, which is what everybody gets nowadays. And then we also have the community integration and habilitation or CIH waiver. And by the way, nobody calls it community integration and habilitation. They all just say CIH waiver because the name is so long. Um, but that is now an emergency based waiver. Now, I will also say um, right before the pandemic, um, the state was, was in the process of redesigning uh, these waivers. And when I say right before the pandemic, I mean, our final town hall meeting on waiver redesign was literally the week everything shut down. Um, and, and while a lot of the, those waiver redesign um, things have been on hold, some of those uh, redesign processes have, have actually continued to go through. And the state is um, starting to have um, uh, information sessions because once the pandemic and that federal public health emergency has ended, they're going to restart that waiver design, uh, redesign process um, more, more in earnest um, because the state really does want to hear from individuals um, and from families to figure out what do you want this waiver to do for you? How can this waiver help you live your best life possible? In order to qualify for a, uh, for a waiver through the Bureau of Developmental Disabilities, you have to have a diagnosed intellectual or developmental disability or related condition prior to age 22. And that age 22 uh, piece is the, is, the, is the one piece that, that is non-negotiable. 
Um, so you had to be diagnosed prior to age 22. The condition must be expected to continue indefinitely, and you must meet a Medicaid, um, you must be eligible for Medicaid in a waiver compatible category, which is a weird way of saying that. But, but what that really means is that if an individual is already over the age of 18, they must be determined disabled by the Social Security Administration in order to have um, an appropriate type of Medicaid for the waiver. When I started this job, I thought Medicaid was just Medicaid. I was wrong. There are literally more than 20 different types of Medicaid out there. Some of them are compatible with the waiver, others are not. So they have to be um, eligible in a, in a waiver compatible category. Um, and again, one of the good things here is that family income and family assets are not counted toward, uh, against the individual when it comes to Medicaid eligibility. So a diagnosis alone though isn't enough. You also have to meet a certain level of care to qualify uh, for these waivers. And for the BEADS waivers, um, that means you have to meet ICFBB level of care. And so when they're trying to, to dis discern that, um, first of all, they're going to do what they call a level of care screening. That's really about a one hour interview where they're gonna ask uh, your loved one all sorts of questions about what they can do and what they need help with. And, and so one of, the, one of the things I actually recommend is talk with your loved one about this ahead of time so that they know what to expect here and explain to them that, you know, these people are asking questions about, about you know, what you can do and what you need help with because if you need help with something, they wanna provide you that help. And, and that's just one piece of advice from one mom to, you know, to another parent. Um, because when my son went through this process and we were talking about things, he started getting really upset. And finally, I got out of him that he thought they were asking questions to make fun of him. I'll be perfectly honest. My son never noticed anything like that. So that was not on my radar to worry about. But once I realized that was our problem, I said, Andy, there are things you didn't help with, right? And he goes, yeah. I said, needing help, that's not a bad thing, is it? And he goes, well, no. I said, that's what they're trying to find out, honey. They want to know what you need help with so they can give you that help. Once my son realized that, he did a lot better. He, he was a lot calmer because he realized they're just trying to help. So, so that may be a conversation you may want to have with your loved one uh, prior to this process. Um, but I will also say while they want to talk with your loved one, they want you there too. Um, and by all means, chime in with whatever information you have because sometimes our loved ones don't necessarily give all of the information so for example when they say can you cook and your child says yes you can say but sweetheart you set the kitchen on fire every time you try to cook because they don't think to add that part okay so so by all means you know share whatever information you have and, and they know to to pay attention to that but then, you know, that interview is only part of it and, and it's a big part, um, but it's only part of it. They also look at, um, you know, psychological evaluations, educational records, and that does include the IEP. They look at medical records. So they, they look at a lot of different things. And they are looking to see if a person has substantial functional limitations in three out of these six categories. First one is mobility. And here they're looking at, hey, can you walk? If you can't walk, uh, or if you can walk, do you fall more than once a week? If you can't walk, can you control your own wheelchair? Can you transfer in and out of that wheelchair on your own? Those are the things they're looking at in mobility. In language, they're looking for, for basic communication. You know, can you somehow be understood by other people? Self-care, um, there they're looking at, you know, can you go to the bathroom on your own? Can you bathe yourself? Um, can you put on sweats and slip on shoes? Because I kid you not, the directions specifically um, exclude fasteners in that. But it's those next three areas that a lot of people tend to qualify in. The next section is learning. There they're looking at things. Um, they're not looking strictly at IQ. And at one point they were, that was not ever supposed to be what they were doing. Here they're looking at things like, does it take you longer to learn? Do you need specialized instruction to learn? Can you retain uh, skills? Um, then we're looking at self-direction or what I nicknamed the initiation section because it's all about initiating things. Can you make plans and follow through with them? And, it, and that section is all about that follow through piece. Um, and then uh, the last section is capacity for independent living. There they're looking at things like, 
Can you refill your own prescriptions? Can you go to the bank on your own? Can you cook? And here's the thing, they use that, um, that level of care screening on anyone age six and older. Um, and, and that sounds a little bit strange, but, but once you're six years old, you are officially school-aged. And so they lump you in with, with 18 year olds. So if you have young children, I'll be honest, their age is half gonna qualify them. Um, but if your child is younger than the age of six, um, they, they ask questions, um, but it's a little bit more informal. They're, they're looking for the same type of information, um, but, but trying to make it more age appropriate. Um, I see a, a question here. So, um, so uh, Denise is asking, so if they're 18 or older, they have to apply for disability first? Um, that gets a little bit tricky, Denise. Um, and, and what I will say, because the social security piece is, well, I've got an hour presentation just on that part. Um, that gets a, they have to be determined disabled. One of the things, if they are already over the age of 18 and they have not gone through that social security disability process yet, um, what you can do is you can actually start the waiver process and then you can even use that, that information from uh, the waiver interview to help with the social security piece. You can start this process now. If you happen uh, to get approved for the waiver and, and, and uh, start your Medicaid first, if you happen to get this uh, denied by social security, you can keep your Medicaid and keep your waiver while you're in that social security appeals process. Um, are we playing a little bit of, of um, you know, chicken and the egg there? A little bit, uh, just to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but you can you can go ahead and start this process first. And, and in fact, that's what I would recommend because then you can use the information from this process to help with the social security process as well. So how do you apply? Well, the good news is it is so much easier to apply than it used to be. Um, you can actually apply online and it takes all of five minutes. The two hardest parts about that application is that you have to know your, your loved one's social security number. And then remembering when it says you, it doesn't mean you, it means your loved one. So yes, they really are asking for your four-year-old's marital status, okay? Um, but you can apply at uh, beadsgateway.fssa.in.gov. Um, this is, like I said, takes about five minutes to do. It is not a difficult process at all. Um, then, um, you are supposed to get a call um, within about two weeks um, after you've submitted that application. And, and everything with beads goes based on application date. So getting that in, you know, kind of starts uh, a lot of things and everything is based on application date. And so then they, they'll get in touch with you um, to get some additional paperwork, um, including something called a confirmation of diagnosis form uh, that needs to be signed by a doctor. Um, and, and they'll set up uh, your, your level of care interview. Um, I will say that's supposed to happen within two weeks. That is their goal. I will say that right now, um, one of the things that, that's happening is that um, just like everybody else, uh, the state is understaffed and they've got a lot of brand new staff. So, so they are getting people on board. Um, but what that also means is it's taking a little bit longer uh, than usual. So, um, so, so bear with them, give them a little bit of grace uh, as, they, as they catch up with everything. Um, and, and don't worry about it because everything goes uh, based off of that application date. So it's when they received your application. So, so if it takes them a little bit longer, that in and of itself is not gonna cause any sort of problem. Um, and if you haven't heard from them, um, I would say if you haven't heard from them in about three weeks, call up your local beads office and just to, just to say, hey, I submitted my son's application on this date. I just wanted to check in with you, okay? And, and make sure you got it. Um, so, that, so that would be one way um, to handle that. There is a waiting list uh, for the Family Supports Waiver. With the pandemic, it has grown. Right now, it's about two years long, which I know is a while. But at the same time, not that long ago, this waiting list used to be 15 years long. And I'm just grateful none of you have to do that anymore. So right now, the waiting list is about two years long. Um, but there are a couple of exceptions to that. Um, and, and if you aren't sure whether or not you have already applied, there is actually a waiting list portal. So you can check to see if you're on the waiting list. Um, the uh, website for that is, is right there on your screen. Um, and, and what you can do is you can put your, your loved one's information there. You will need their date of birth and their la the last four digits of their social security number. 
anytime Beads is looking somebody up, they always do it by name, date of birth, and last four of their social. Okay. Um, and if you are on the waiting list, you will see you will see your loved one's information come up and then you will see an application date listed. If you don't see an application date listed, call up your local beads office to, to find out what's going on because it something may have uh, gotten crossed um, somewhere along the lines. I will also say beads does everything by mail. So you want to make sure that um, they always have your up-to-date contact information and especially your address so that when your loved one's name does come up on the waiting list, um, they can they can get a hold of you. Carly? Yes. We do have another question. And it says, I filled out the application and okay. it asked for a doctor's diagnosis. I got that, but I don't know where to email it. You're, believe it or not, they don't do email. <laughs> so, so they are very old school. Um, in all honesty, you either need to mail it in, drop it off, or fax it in. Um, and uh, Jill, do you think you, you would be able to put um, the bead, the link to the bead map um, in the in the chat as well? Um, if not, once we're done, I can I can put it in there. Um, so that so that you can find out where your local beads office is. Um, if you happen to be um, in the Indianapolis metro area, I happen to know that fax number off the top of my head because I'm a geek. Um, but uh, that fax number is 855-525-9378. Uh, um, and you can fax it in that way. Um, or their office is um, is just off of is just off of Keystone, uh, just south the uh, 62nd Street, right next to Glendale Mall. Um, sorry, guys, I don't know where all of the other ones are. <laughs> I'm marked on my, <laughs> on my computer, um, but that's the one that I, that I deal with the most often. Um, but yeah, that, that's the easiest way uh, to do that. Um, you can also email it if you don't have access to a fax machine. There's a good chance your school would be able, would be willing to fax it off for you, or, or um, if you if you attend um, a church or synagogue, that they would be willing to fax it off to you. If not, you can always, um, frankly, you can even email it to me at Carly that's K A R L Y at A R C I N D dot org, and I would be happy to, to send it in for you too. And then you know give you the proof that they got it. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's the easiest way to, to get that into them. And in and, and all honesty, guys, that, that confirmation of diagnosis form is their non-negotiable. They are not allowed to move forward without having that. So, so it really is a, an important document to have. I was saying that there's about a two-year waiting list uh, for, for the Family Supports Waiver. There are a couple of exceptions to that because the state has... Um, has two different groups who can request priority status. And when you request priority status, you get to jump to the front of the line. And the first uh, priority category um, is 18 to 24 year olds who have finished school. That means they've either graduated they've, or they've gotten their certificate of completion. Um, if, if your loved one is in that, is in that category, um, all you have to do is, is give your, uh, a copy of the diploma or the certificate of completion to the beads office. Um, and, and request priority status and your loved one jumps to the front of the line. The other one is, is a new um, priority service category. Um, and when I say new, I mean, it, this started in October of 2019, okay? So, um, and that is the children of active duty service members or veterans can also request priority status. And the big reason for that was that the state recognized that, that there were a lot of, of children of service members and because they were in the service, they were moving so often that their children never actually got to have um, the services that they needed. So the state created this priority category specifically for the children of, of active duty service members and veterans. And it does need to be, you know, children or stepchildren. It can't be, you know, the brother that you are guardian of, unfortunately. It's got to be a child. Um, and all you need to do is provide a copy of your DD-214 um, and request that priority status. And that will also allow you to jump to the front of the line. So with the Family Supports Waiver, this is where most people begin. Um, this one has um, an, a, a capped uh, budget for services. And in, 20, uh, in 2022, the maximum uh, service budget is $19,614 worth of waiver services per year. And that does not include any of the medical part. It's just the waiver services. 
Um, and, and this is this was an increase. We we were able to get um, frankly we were able to get um, the rates for services uh, increased so that we could pay direct support professionals more. And and thankfully the state also increased that maximum budget so that nobody would be losing services as a result of that. So the maximum budget for the family support waiver is nineteen thousand six hundred and fourteen dollars in waiver services per year. Now the CIH waiver is a little bit different um, because the CIH waiver is an emergency based waiver. Um, in order to qualify, you have to be eligible for a beads waiver and meet one of the priority um, categories for that. But the big difference between the CIH waiver and the family supports waiver is first of all budget. Um, and secondly, that um, the budget for services is, is based on uh, an individual's need, their age, their health conditions and their living situation. And then the other big uh, difference uh, with the CIH waiver is it provides residential services. Now that doesn't mean, you know, uh, it's not paying for the housing, it's paying for the staff uh, to care for an individual. I will also say that if a child has a CIH waiver, it's rare, but it can happen. If a child has a CIH waiver, that CIH waiver cannot pay for out of home placement um, until they are uh, after the age of 18. So I said that this is an emergency, um, uh, an emergency waiver. So let's talk about how you qualify for that. The first is loss or incapacity of a caregiver when no other caregiver is available. Um, if a child is under 18, that doesn't apply because that's when the Department of Child Services is supposed to step in. So here we're really talking uh, about adults. It's loss or incapacity of the caregiver. Second is caregiver over the age of 80 when no other caregiver is available. So if dad is 80 but mom is 79, we got to wait another year. And if you're wondering why in the world is it 80, because when the legislature passed this, that is what they could compromise on. It was supposed to, um, it was supposed to decrease every year. Guess what? It did not. So it is still currently sitting at, at age 80. Those are also some of the things that they are considering when it comes to waiver redesign. So by all means, you should give your opinions and weigh in on that waiver redesign. And the next uh, category or the next criteria would be extraordinary health and safety risk. And they really do mean extraordinary health and safety risk. The fact that school is over and you don't have anyone to, to watch your child uh, between the end of school and you getting home from work is not considered an extraordinary health and safety risk. Um, aging out of a childhood placement by the Department of Education or the Department of Child Services uh, would be another uh, criteria for this. Um, and so sometimes uh, the Department of Education um, or the Department of Child Services may place uh, somebody in a residential center like Damar or TC Harris for Department of Education. Um, those are both also options for Department of Child Services along with, with several other uh, residential placement services. Um, but also if the child is in foster care and they're aging out of foster care. And that's kind of the key. It's not just getting, it's not just leaving those facilities, it's aging out of that placement. That can be grounds for a CIH waiver. Um, and then also leaving an institutional setting like a nursing facility, um, a state operated facility, which would be a state hospital, um, supervised group living, which would be um, a, a needs group home, um, or uh, an intermediate care facility uh, for the developmentally disabled. That would be uh, grounds for uh, getting a CIH waiver. And then also substantiated cases of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Carly, we do have another question. Absolutely. It Go says, right ahead. If the sole caregiver of an adolescent needs surgery and has several weeks of recovery, mm -hmm. would that count as incapacitation of caregiver? So it can. Um, the, the reality is they're going to look at that as a temporary situation. And I know to me, that's one of those, you know, I know that if I were living that, that's something that I would be really scared of. Um, one of the things, um, if your child, or one of the things you can do, even if your child doesn't already have um, a Medicaid waiver is you can call the Bureau of Developmental Disability Services. Um, if your child already has a waiver, that gets a whole lot easier. Uh, but one of the things that they can do is they can arrange for what's called a respite stay um, at, a, at a skilled nursing facility, usually is where those are at, um, you know, temporarily while you're recovering. They, they can do it in those situations. They can also arrange the, those, um, I'm going to call them uh, medium length stays because, you know, normally it's, it's for less than a month. 
um, but they can also arrange that like, you know, if, um, you know, I've had, I've had families where, you know, they needed, they wanted to, the one I'm thinking of, you know, they wanted to go to their son's wedding in California, but they knew their son with disabilities would have a really hard time with that. So they arranged for him to have um, a respite stay um, here in Indiana so that they could go off and, and enjoy their, their son's uh, their other son's wedding. Um, and that's something that, that the Bureau of Developmental Disabilities can arrange. Um, it, and the nice thing is it does not come out of your waiver budget when they do those sorts of things. That, that's a different funding stream. So, that, so they can do that. And especially in a situation like that, um, if you've got an adolescent, um, gets, a, gets a little bit trickier and they, and they may want to call in the Department of Child Services, not because there's any, you know, thoughts of, of neglect or anything, but simply because Department of Child Services also has funding that they can tap into to pay for, uh, for those types of services too. So by all means, call the local beads office um, to, to, say, to tell them what's going on um, and, and see if they can help arrange uh, a short-term respite stay um, while you're recovering. Um, and that's something that, that they have the ability to do, okay? Uh, Jill, do we have any other questions at the moment? Because I see some things in the chat. So we no, I've been posting in the chat the information oh, okay. the the bureau uh, <clears throat> excuse me the disabilities okay. website your facts okay. and your email. Okay, we did just have a comment though about um, whenever you were talking about the um, um, being able to fax information in, uh -huh. um, we did have somebody that just commented. They said that. They can also have their doctor fax it in to them once they have filled oh, it out. Absolutely. That's a great idea. And I'm so glad you pointed that out. Thank you very much because you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, so let's talk about those BEADS uh, waiver services. Like I was saying, BEADS waivers are designed to help people get out and be as active in the community as possible. And that means being person-centered, being individualized, and helping self-advocates um, you know, be, be active in an integrated part of the community, to learn independent living skills, uh, to supplement their needs, and then to work toward the self-advocate's vision of a good life. And you're going to hear that phrase over and over again, because that really is something that the Bureau of Developmental Disabilities has adopted as their philosophy, is they're there to help people live whatever their vision of a good life is because we all have you know different things that we want in life and it's not about what I want for my son it's what my son wants for himself and it's not about what his case manager wants or what his teacher wants it's what he wants for himself and that's really the focus so when you have a, a Medicaid waiver one of the things you're going to create is a person-centered individualized support plan in case you know or a PCISP because of course we need more acronyms in our life. Um, I, I like to joke, think IEP without the drama um, because this person-centered individualized support plan, there we're gonna talk about a person's strengths. We're gonna talk about you know, their hopes and their desires and their needs. We're gonna talk about their life circumstances. And then we're going to chart a path for the individualized support team. Those are the, the people that they work with. Um, to follow in supporting the individual achieve their vision of a good life. And so it really is about focusing on whatever it is that individual wants. What is their definition of a good life? And how do we help them get there? And so um, one of the ways that they do that is by using something called the life course framework. And the core belief behind life course is that all people have the right to live, love, work, play, and pursue their life's aspirations in their community. Um, and in fact, you know, that is the core belief of Life Force, and, it, and it's, you know, so integral that the, Bureau, that the Division of Disability and Rehabilitative Services, which is the umbrella agency that, that covers the Bureau of Developmental Disabilities, they have actually um, adopted that as their mission statement, that all people, not all people with disabilities, all people have the right to live love, work, play, and pursue their life's aspirations in their community. And so with my course, they got, they got some guiding principles um, to help individuals define what they want, and just as importantly, what they don't want in life. Because sometimes, you know, defining what you don't want in life can be a little bit easier, and that is just as important. It's also to help determine an individual's strengths, to determine what resources they already have available to them, especially when it comes to technology, community supports, 
relationships, and eligibility specific uh, options. To identify that individual's vision of a good life and to determine the skills and resources that they still need to achieve that good life. And so they've got all sorts of tools to help with this. And, and Jill put um, the, the link to all of this in the chat. Um, you can find all of these materials at lifecoursetools.com. The great news is, first of all, um, they break things down into different life stages. So they are materials specifically designed for early childhood. Um, there are materials specifically for school-aged kids, specifically for transition to adulthood, as well as adulthood and aging. Um, and they've got tons of tools available. They also have uh, lots of videos to show you how to use these tools. And the best part is they are all free <laughs> and free is good. So, so this is one, this is called um, Exploring Life Possibilities. And so they also break it down into what they call different life domains. So things like daily living and employment, community living, healthy living, and so on. And so down at the bottom, you know, it, it talks about what we've traditionally done in each of those areas. So when we would talk about daily life and employment, we would talk about sheltered workshops and day programs and work crews or work enclaves. But the top part, or kind of the middle part, is what we're talking about now. So while we used to only think about sheltered workshops and day programs, now we're talking about college and technical schools. We're talking about job coaches. We're talking about volunteering. We're talking about competitive employment. And we're not just talking about jobs. We're talking about careers. And we're even talking about owning our own business. We're talking about micro enterprises. So the there are more possibilities for people with disabilities than there have ever been before. And I like this tool just because it helps give you some ideas and, and helps you think about what are the options that are out there now? What are the things that are available now? Because we are developing more and more things every single day. Um, and this is uh, what's called an integrated support options tool. Uh, because one of, the, one of the tools they have is called an integrated support star. That's really where we're thinking about what are the different resources we already have available to us and what are the resources we still need to develop to get uh, to our vision of a good life. And you see this star, which you're going to see in a minute, and it's blank. And it feels really overwhelming and intimidating to figure out what am I supposed to put in here? That's what this tool is about, is to help you think about, you know, what types of, of resources are out there and available on those different um, uh, integrated support options. So, you know, whether it's personal strengths and assets, whether it's uh, what relationships do you have that can help you uh, achieve your good life? What, um, what technology can help you achieve your good life? And, and I'll be honest, that is one of those areas when we first started talking about life course that I tended to overlook because when I would think about technology, I would think about these gigantic communication devices that Medicaid buys for people. Um, I didn't think about things like the calendar app on your phone or a calculator on your phone or auto prescription refill. Those are all uh, technology. Those are all things that make our life easier. But those are also things that for the general public just makes life easier. But for a person with a disability can be the difference between success and failure. Imagine, you know, you know, before, you know, when it came to people managing their own money, you had some people who, who had trouble, you know, paying their bills on time. Guess what? There are a lot of people without disabilities who have trouble paying their bills on time. Auto, auto bill pay makes life a heck of a lot easier for everybody. And that can be the difference between success and failure. So, you know, a lot of things like that. And this is, happens to be a, a two-page uh, tool uh, where they break things down into those different life domains. This is another tool that I find helpful. This is the developing a vision tool. And there are two different versions of this. There's one for the individual to fill out. And then there's one for the family to fill out. And I always recommend that you fill these out separately and then bring and then come together to discuss them because you would be amazed at how often your vision of a good life for your, for your loved one and their vision of a good life for themselves don't always match. But imagine if you could also share this with, this, with their teacher. If you could say to their teacher, here's what he wants in life. Here's his vision of a good life. How are we going to help him do that? How can we, how can we use um, school? How can we arrange his education? How can we get the, the accommodations and teach him the skills he needs so that, he's, so that he's working toward his vision of a good life? 
And that leads us to my favorite of all the tools, which is the life trajectory tool. So here in the upper um, right hand corner is what is your vision of a good life? Um, just as important on the bottom right hand corner, what do you not want in life? Here on the left, what life experiences do you have that are taking you to your good life? And then what experiences do you still need to get to your good life? Just as importantly, what past experiences do you have taking you away from what you want? What are the things you need to be careful of so that you don't go toward what you don't want? The first time I ever sat down uh, and did this with my son, he was uh, a junior in high school. And frankly, I was trying to figure out what we were going to do when high school ended. I had been trying to have those conversations with him for a long time, and they were just going nowhere. And so finally, one day, I, I called him down to the dining room table, and, and we, were doing this, uh, we were doing this tool together. I said, Andy, what's your vision of a good life? And he goes, I don't know. I said, okay, well, what are some of the things you want in life? I don't know. I mean, let's be honest, if the kid could have jumped up and run away, he would have, but I think he knew he had gotten in trouble if he did. And so I knew if I just kept at it that way, we were going to get nowhere. So I kind of broke it down a little bit more. I said, well, you know what a good life to me is? I want to go to the movies. Do you want to go to the movies? And he snapped his head up because he was not thinking about that kind of an answer. And he looked at me really suspicious, but he was like, yeah. I said, okay. And so we wrote down movies. I said, and you know what? I don't want to go to restaurants. My son does not care about restaurants, so we did not write that down. I said, what about you? What are things you want to do? And he thought for a minute, and he goes, I'm going to go to GameStop. I said, okay. And so we wrote down GameStop. And I know that it sounds silly that we're talking about going to the movies and going to GameStop, but let's be honest. It's those little things in life that make life enjoyable. And by talking about those little things in life, we were then able to, to broach them into some of the bigger things in life. I said, okay, Andy, you want to be able to go to the movies. You want to go to games. So if you want to play, you want to play laser tag. What do you need to do that? He thought for a minute. He goes, well, you need money. So that's right. You need money. How do you get money? And he goes, well, you need a job. I said, you're right. You need a job. What kind of jobs do you think you might want to do? And that's how we were then able to springboard into that conversation of, what type of job did he want? What type of career did he want? What did he want when it came to employment? So that then we could start talking about, you know, what he wanted in life um, and expand from there. And this is something that, you know, it's not just that you do it once. This is something that you update every so often. This is also something that can be really helpful for the other people in your life. Do you have uh, somebody who's about to graduate from college or had, who has just graduated from college and is trying to figure out what to do? you can use life course. If you um, are, are considering a career change, you can use life course. These tools, while they were designed with people with disabilities in mind, they are not exclusively for people with disabilities. So, so these can be some really great tools um, to help you think and plan. But with this, um, with the life portfolio is what it's called, one part of it is, is the life trajectory. And there are a couple of other parts, and this is another part of it. Um, and, and this is what I call a cheat sheet to the individual. That top box, what, is, what do people like and admire about me? You know, one of the realities is we don't tell people with that enough. You know, especially we don't tell that to people with disabilities, but we don't tell each other those sorts of things often enough. And so, you know, what do people like and admire about me? In that middle box, what's important to me? And then at the bottom, how do you best support me? Imagine. If at the beginning of the school year, you could hand this to your child's teacher, you just gave them a cheat sheet to your child. You told them what's important to them, and that can be a great motivator. You told them what people like and admire about them so that that's their first perception um, of your loved one. And most importantly, you also told them, how do you best support me? How do you best support your loved one so that they know how to work with your child better? Imagine if you could give that information as well as that life trajectory information of what is your child's vision of a good life? That's what we're all striving for. That's got to be our focus. And imagine if you could hand that to the school, how much easier um, that could make uh, some of the conversations you have with them. And then you have that integrated support star, and that's what that other tool um, was designed to help you fill out. You know, what are the resources they have available to them? Um, what are the things they have that they already have? What are the things they still need to develop? Um, so that's what this tool is about. 
And so here's an example. This is a daily life uh, support star. And so, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to the technology that's available for a person, maybe that's electronic reminders and alarm clock. Maybe it's that they know how to use their cell phone, um, that they have access to an iPad, that they've got their calendar, uh, their, their calculator, their computer. Um, it's auto prescription refill. My son, bless his heart, he used to, he finally got to the point where he told us the day before he was out of medication that he was running out of medication. Um, but once we, once we switch to auto prescription refill, you don't ever have to worry about it anymore. The only thing I have to worry about is CVS calling us 900 times uh, to pick up the, the medication, you know, and it just makes life easier. Um, when we talk about uh, community resources, you know, maybe we're talking about, you know, the parks department or the library. Maybe we're talking about the centers for independent living. Um, maybe we're talking about, um, you know, community centers and, and churches and, and synagogues and mosques. Maybe we're, you know, talking about a lot of different uh, resources that can be available in our community. Um, public transportation, Uber and Lyft. Then we also have disability or eligibility specific options. And that doesn't just mean um, disability specific options. So if you've got a loved one who wants to own their own home someday, there are first time home buyer programs out there. They're available for every first time home buyer including for some home buyers with disabilities. I think a lot of times we, we focus on the disability part and, and forget about some of the other things that, that are out there and available for our loved ones too. So, so this is just an example of, of one of those support stars. Um, this is a, a, a life trajectory specific to respite because a lot of families um, request respite care. And I think part of that is because it's the one service they've ever heard of, okay? Um, but what you know, why do you want respite? What would respite provide for your loved one? And what would it provide for you? And are there some other ways to, to get what you want um, at the same time? Um, again, you know, this is, this is part of that one that's focusing specific on, on respite, um, as well as a, a, an example support star on that. But when it comes to those waivers for the Bureau of Developmental Disabilities, there are about 30 different services currently available. And like I said, the, the state is really looking at redesigning waivers. Um, and so you should absolutely weigh in. But some of the, some of the common waiver services, um, first of all, is case management. And that is the one service that is actually required for everybody. Um, but beyond that, we have um, participant assistance in care, which um, is basically an extra set of hands to help out with, with whatever you want. We have um, what's called day habilitation. That's one of those changes that happened during the pandemic. We merged together community habilitation and facility-based habilitation. Um, uh, we merged those services together and renamed it day habilitation, although it can be done after school and in the evenings as well. Um, but that's probably one of the broadest things out there because it's anything a person does in the community. But by merging those two together, um, it, it provided some more flexibility. So for example, you know, if you had community habilitation and your plan was that, you know, you were going to go to the park and play basketball and it started raining, um, well, you couldn't go back to the, to the agency's office to do something else. Now you have the ability to do that. Um, now you can kind of split that time so that, you know, you're going out in the community sometimes, but maybe you're going to do a cooking class um, at the agency's office or, or something along those lines. Um, there's uh, behavior management. And that doesn't necessarily mean bad behaviors. That means learning new ways to do things. Um, my son does behavior management in part um, to help him learn how to deal how to uh, deal with frustration and how to appropriately deal with frustration. Um, but also because you know, up until recently he's been a teenager, so you know, learning how to deal and you know manage that is, is a good thing. Um, music therapy, recreation therapy. Um, eventually, if they need it, there can be adult day services that can be extended employment support so that if they do have, uh, if they do get a job in the community, but they need somebody to kind of come in and check in on them every so often to make sure things are going well, uh, there are waiver services available for them. So literally about 30 different services available under the waiver. And really when it comes to, to the waiver, what you want to think about is what are your loved one's needs, what are their wants, and what are their dreams? Um, and that's where life, life force can really, you know, come into play because it can really help you uh, help you narrow these things down and, and really identify what are your needs, what are your wants, what are your dreams, um, so that you know when when we are able to determine those things and we determine what resources are already available and what they still need, 
um, so that they can achieve, you know, their good life. Um, Arlie? Yes. We do have a couple more comments. Uh, we have a question that says, can you use funds for things like dental work? Example, higher cost for sedation dental work. And then we do have just a comment that um, your public library can fax papers for you as well as um, for a small fee. Absolutely. Um, the dental work, you know what? That is a great question. I'm so glad you asked that because guess what? That doesn't come out of your waiver budget. That actually comes out of your Medicaid health insurance um, or your health coverage. Technically, it's not insurance. Um, the way that works, because in order to have a waiver, you have to have Medicaid. And, and like I said, when you have a waiver, you break a lot of the regular Medicaid rules. One of them is that you are able to have both private health insurance and Medicaid at the same time. Um, and so the way that works is if you go to a provider who accepts Medicaid, they will bill your private insurance first. And then whatever your private insurance doesn't pay, Medicaid takes care of. So for example, my son used to go to Riley um, and he would see his, his psychiatrist and his psychologist there. We would go, they would bill my private insurance and Medicaid would take care of the copay. Well, my sense that just because you have it doesn't mean you have to use it. So for example, my son's pediatrician does not take Medicaid. So when he goes to his pediatrician, um, they bill my private insurance and I pay my $25 per pay just like I always do. And so when you have those um, additional costs like um, like the additional cost for dental care and sedation, uh, dental care in particular, Medicaid will take care of those costs. So, so that actually comes out of the Medicaid health insurance part and not the Medicaid waiver budget. So that's the best part of this. I will also say that especially um, when your child is under the age of 21, there's a special um, regulation with Medicaid called early periodic screening, diagnosis and treatment or EPSDT. And um, what that says is, hey, if it's medically necessary, Medicaid's got to cover it. So, for example, if you have, you know, 20 uh, visits of speech therapy per year or a limit of 20 speech therapy visits per year, um, guess what? Once you, you hit that maximum with your private insurance, then Medicaid takes care of all the rest so, so that you can get your loved one. Um, or your child in particular, the additional speech OTPT that they actually need. But it does mean uh, using a, a provider who does take Medicaid. And I will say that when you have private insurance and Medicaid, um, that can sometimes make it a little bit easier uh, for a doctor's office or, or, a, or a medical provider uh, to take you on as a new patient because you've got both of those funding streams. So I hope that, that I hope that that helps uh, clarify that part a little bit because yeah, the fact that it actually comes out of the health insurance part makes that a whole lot easier for you too. Um, there are some other uh, resources that are available to people as well beyond just waivers. So for example, um, they can work with Vocational Rehabilitation Services, which is a state agency whose whole purpose is to help people with disabilities find jobs. And they can do that a lot of different ways. They can actually help people, you know, find jobs in particular. And what they're doing oftentimes is paying for, uh, is providing the funding for a job coach. But they can also help with things like, um, like uh, training and, and education too. So for example, if you've got a, a loved one who wants to go to trade school or wants to go to college, you know, VR has, has um, can provide some supports that way too, whether that's helping the individual get some accommodations uh, when, it come, when it comes to that education, like extra time on tests or, or individualized testing, whether that's um, helping pay for a tutor or, or for, for some equipment that they may need, or, um, you know, or, or, you know, other things, they have, the, they have the ability to provide those. There's also a program called Pre-Employment Transition Services, or pre ed That is also something that is, um, that is through the Vocational Rehabilitation Services, but it's done in cooperation with school systems. And, and the reason I say it that way is, is because I want to make sure you know it is not a school-based program, which means you don't have to have it in the IEP, which means you are not limited to the school year, which means the school doesn't have to agree to, to what you're doing in pre-ed services. But this is designed uh, for 14 to 24-year-olds um, to help them with those pre-employment skills. So a lot of that is career exploration. A lot of it is learning self-advocacy skills um, and, and a lot of different um, options within there. 
Uh, supplemental security income is, is a service through um, the Social Security Administration. Um, it's money to help pay for, for basic living expenses. Now, unlike the unlike Medicaid, when you have the waiver, Social Security absolutely looks at family income and family assets for anyone under the age of 18. So you do need to know that. Then there's also something called the Children's Mental Health Initiative. So if you have a, a child um, who, have, who also has uh, mental health needs, uh, this may be something that can help provide some support for that. And then just other medical, uh, medical supports and community programs. Um, and, and here's a, a list of, of some of those. So Carly, I was gonna say, it looks like we've got some more questions. Please, we do. Hey guys. Um, it says, does Indiana offer anything like other states when it comes to reimbursement for private insurance once they are on Medicaid? For example, a lot of states refer to it as HIPP, H-I-P-P. -P. Yeah. We're, we're from Arkansas originally. Mm -hmm. You know what? Unfortunately, Indiana does not offer that. And, and that's one of those things that, um, that I would love to see us do. Uh, unfortunately, as of right now, we don't do that. We, we've had some conversations um, with the state on those things. I, I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's on the horizon anytime soon. Um, but it is absolutely something that that we look at too. Colorado does the same thing, where you know Colorado will will essentially reimburse uh, parents for the individual's health insurance premiums, um, and it makes and it makes a big difference. Um, but right now, we don't do that. other questions do we have? I forgot Jill asked me to not share my screen or not do my video. So <laughs> make you lose your fun. You're fine, Carly. You're okay. fine. Um, we do have, uh, Cynthia did say thank you for doing this. Um, oh. This this is a great opportunity, you guys, for answering some of these questions because Carly is right here. Um, and um, this is the best. I mean, we couldn't yeah. ask for anything better, you know. Um, yeah. and, and a big part of this is there is a lot of misinformation out there when it comes to two waivers, but more importantly, there's a lot of old information that is still out there uh, when it comes to waivers. And, and, you know, one of the biggest things that I want to make sure you, you know is that the state of Indiana really is, you know, really has had a big shift in, in how they do things and, and in their views. And, and really they are focusing on, you know, making sure that individuals with, this, with disabilities have a good life, have a meaningful life, get to have all of the opportunities that everybody else has. And, and one of the things I see is that, you know, with, well, you know, with not only the Bureau of Developmental Disabilities and all of the, dis the Division of Disability and Rehabilitative Services, but FSSA in general and even the state legislature, you can actually see the respect that they have for people with disabilities. And, and that has not always been the case, but I can say that is the case right now. You know, um, there's an organization called Self Advocates of Indiana, which is a, a wonderful organization, and and um, we do a lot of we provide a lot of support for them. Their offices within our office, and and one of the things um, that I see is, you know, not only are state agencies seeking out self advocates for their input, the legislature is regularly seeking out self-advocates for their input and for their thoughts on legislation that may be pending. The different agencies are looking uh, at self-advocates to, you know, to get their input on, on policy decisions that they're making and not in a token way. They, they are genu genuinely seeking out um, self-advocates input. And, and I see a lot of, a lot of respect. Uh, for people with disabilities that, that haven't necessarily, you know, didn't always see in the past, but I definitely see that now. And so the idea of making sure that people with disabilities are able to determine what their own lives are going to look like, and then making sure that they have the support that they need to achieve whatever their vision of a good life is, and making sure that they know that they can change their vision of a good life anytime they want to, that's something that gives me a lot of hope. So I see we've got some more questions uh, that have come in as well. Um, is traditional Medicaid attached to acceptance to the waiver program? I've seen that they are trying to put people in Anthem Medicaid instead of traditional Medicaid when you have the waiver. That is actually something that, that we are working on. Um, so like I was saying earlier, believe it or not, there are literally more than 20 different types of Medicaid. Um, as of right now, 
when you have a Medicaid waiver, you are supposed to be on traditional fee for service Medicaid, which means you are not supposed to be in a managed care version of Medicaid. The reality is within the Medicaid computer system, you know, they have a hierarchy of all of those different categories of Medicaid. And when they are looking at, it, at an individual, they start at the beginning of that hierarchy and work their way down. And as soon as they find a type of Medicaid that you qualify for it, they stop. And sometimes that means um, a managed care version of Medicaid. And, and that's one of the things we're actually working at the Office of Medicaid Policy and planning on right now to, to try to fix because we, we do have this situation where somebody should be on um, uh, traditional Medicaid disability and they keep getting uh, switched over to managed care, which then causes all sorts of problems with, uh, with providers and coverage and prior authorizations and all that. We're, we're working with them right now to fix that. But um, in theory, you should be able to call the Medicaid office and get switched. I know that is a whole lot easier said than done. Um, we actually have a woman on our staff named Michelle Trevetti, um, who runs our Insurance Advocacy Resource Center. This is one of those things that, that she works on all the time. So, so the first thing I, I would say is, because we've always got to start this way, is, is talking to the Medicaid office um, and having them switched back to, um, you know, to, to Medicaid disability. Um, but I, I want to say we're working on it because we know that this is a, this is a big problem and it winds up causing a lot of problems, especially when there are, you know, prior authorizations for, for various therapies, whether it's ABA, speech, OTPT, whatever. So, yeah, we're, we're working on it. Um, and, okay, we are moving to Indiana with our 28-year-old son with Down syndrome. We are working with Beads for waiver approval. Will he qualify for Medicaid health insurance as we wait for a waiver? So, so in your situation, uh, especially because your son is already 28 years old, um, one of the things um, is that if he already has um, SSI, Supplemental Security Income, um, yes, he would still qualify for Medicaid health insurance uh, when he gets here. Um, you will need to, to fill out um, the um, Medicaid application, which you can find at literally indianamedicaid.com. You're going to click members and then you're going to click uh, apply for uh, apply for coverage. Um, and and you know, the good news now is that because we did tie um, our, our Medicaid uh, eligibility to uh, the Social Security eligibility, um, as long as he's got um, SSI, he'll automatically qualify for Indiana Medicaid. So um, that makes that process a whole lot easier. But yeah, he can have Medicaid health insurance while he's waiting for the waiver. So um, Jill, I hope you don't mind if, if I plug this. Um, but um, one of the other things uh, to let you know about is the ARC of Indiana launched uh, something called the ARC Academy, which is a free online self-paced training platform with all with um, with videos on all sorts of disability related issues. We have everything from little one to five minute introductory videos to some really in-depth webinar length uh, videos, especially on things like navigating the SSI process, um, working and benefits. Um, guardianship and alternatives. So, so that is something um, that you are that you are welcome um, to check out. Um, I'm going to put that link uh, in the um, in the chat. But I have also noticed that if I try to talk and type at the same time, I apparently cannot multitask like that. Well, and Carly, I do want to thank you for mentioning that because I, I've also been on there to uh, watch those videos, and those are very informative videos. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You know what? And, and by all means, check out InSource's uh, archived webinars as well. They've got some really, really wonderful resources. And, and, and in particular, one of the, you know, I've, I've got a whole presentation on, on post-secondary education um, options for students with disabilities. And, and I reference uh, quite a bit from, from InSource, especially I love the annual college survey that they put together where they went down every single campus in the state of Indiana. Um, with what types of, of um, resources they, they already have available for their students, who's the contact person you need to reach out to. They've got some really, really wonderful uh, resources on their website as well. So, And I thank you for that too, too Carly. Um, you know, we, we have to work together in order to make sure that the information is handed out and got out to our parents. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but there is an, another question that's been posted. I, I was just reading that. Um, 
where can I find better information for special needs friendly areas around me um, and find uh, sensory items uh, for my son who has autism? Ooh, you know what, that, that gets a little bit tricky. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Um, in, in part uh, because, you know, what one family will, will love, another family will hate. So, so finding those, you know, finding those special needs friendly areas um, gets a little bit tricky. Um, you know, but, but one of the things I, I would do is, is I really recommend, you know, as weird as this is going to sound, networking. Um, and, and the reason I, I say that is, is because it's other parents who are going to to help you find things and so you know getting involved with with special olympics making sure that um you know that that you're talking to you know if you can talk to the other parents in, in your kids classrooms um and 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 building your network that way finding you know cold calling uh churches and finding out who has um, you know, who has uh, special needs ministries, if that's something that you're interested in. But then also, you know, talking, you know, calling up some of the service providers um, in your area to find out, do they have, um, do they have uh, family groups? Do they, um, do they have self-advocate groups? And do you already have to be a client in order to use some of those? Because sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Um, I will also say uh, Self-Advocates of Indiana um, has started um, some transition aged uh, SAI groups. And so for example, um, there's one that's been well established down in Bloomington through Stonebelt. Um, Easter Seals Crossroads in Indianapolis is just starting their first um, transition aged uh, self-advocates group and, and they're talking to to more people to try to start um, to try to start more chapters and especially more transition age chapters so that's one way to find to find those those more um, those more friendly areas um, I, I will also say I think you know my personal opinion is when there are more people with disabilities um, in an area it tends to be to it tends to be um, more more welcoming and and I will also say and and I know this is a little fraught that I'm saying this. One of the things you might also consider doing is, is reaching out to some of the homeschooling co-ops. Um, and, and the reason I say that is, oh, Jill, don't kill me for saying this. A lot of, of homeschoolers, you know, home, there are a lot of people who homeschool. Some of them are students with disabilities and the, and the families were just not happy with the school system. Um, now, I will also say you need to take that with a grain of salt because, because like I once talked with a mom who was just furious that the school system would not send her son, uh, would not pay for her son to go on an out-of-state college visit because he had a disability. Well, they don't do that for any other student. They're not going to do that just because your child has a disability. So, so sometimes some complaints are, are you know, valid and, and some may not be as reasonable. So, so take some of that with a grain of salt, but, but the reason I, I'm bringing this up is, is a lot of those homeschooling co-ops also have a lot of students with disabilities uh, in them. And so that can be another way to, to network with the people in your community to find out what's out there and available. Um, I will also say, talk with the libraries and the parks departments in your areas, because a lot of them wind up working with, with homeschoolers. They've gotten more used to working with individuals with disabilities. And, and so I, I'm thinking about you know my own uh, library, um, you know, and because they are so used to working with students with disabilities now, um, they've had a big mindset change. So, so for example, now if there's a child who starts having a meltdown in the middle of the library, they're not thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, get your kid under control. Their first thought is, oh, we've got a problem. Are the lights too bright? Is the music too loud? That's a huge mindset shift. Um, and, and so it, it's just because they are so used to working with individuals with disabilities, their mindset has shifted and, and, and they are more welcoming environments now than, than they used to be. And that's not, I mean, don't get me wrong, that's not always the case, but, but especially, you know, those are places to start finding uh, those things. Looks like we've got a couple of other questions. Oh, and, and as far as, um, as far as uh, uh, sensory um, devices, um, or, or at least I think that's what um, what I understood from that is um, you know when you're looking for sensory products, um, believe it or not, uh, not so much school transition fairs, but community resource fairs. Um, if you've got one that's not done through the school system, but maybe is is put on by by an organization or by a by a church or or a community group, um, sometimes they'll have uh, people there who are who are selling 
um, you know, sensory products. Um, I, I'm thinking, you know, like the, even like the, the buddy walk uh, for Down syndrome, there's normally somebody there who, who's selling all sorts of, of sensory, um, and, and sensory uh, products and, and fidgets and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, so, so that's one way to do it. And, and frankly, you know, Google, Amazon, um, you know, if, if you, if you try to type it in as, as occupational therapy things, it's going to cost a whole lot more. Um, but also in all honesty, look at like the dollar section of the toy department, you know, because some of those things um, really do have, have valid sensory, um, sensory elements to them, but they're also a whole lot cheaper because they're just marketed as regular toys. So, and, right. and, and Carly, you would be surprised, well, maybe not surprised, but they're on Pinterest. There is a lot of, there's a lot of things that people sure. have posted for sensory on how to make things that are, that are sensory for kids. Oh, absolutely. You know what? And, and like when my son was younger, I was so focused on things like, like therapies and, and all of that. I didn't think about the things that were just naturally in my community. I didn't think about, you know, the train table at the library being a good way to work on social skills. I didn't think about, you know, story time being a good, a good way to work on communication skills. And, you know, especially if you're, if your kids are younger, you know, one of the things I, I will warn you is children have no tact whatsoever. Okay. But they also don't have the judgment either. So there's going to be a young child who's going to come up to you and say, what's wrong with him? They don't mean it in a bad way. It's, they don't know any tact. And, and so, you know, when you say, oh, he has autism, that means he needs to learn how to play. Can you help him learn how to do that? Man, little kids just want to be helpers. And so they're gladly going to do those things. And if you've got a, a kindergartner or a first grader or second grader or whatever, um, and if you can find the little mommy of the classroom, man, you have just hit pay dirt because she's just going to grab your child's hand and drag him along with her wherever she goes. So, you know, don't get me wrong, it could cause some issues, but it's also a great way to help work on some of those social skills and, and things along those lines. Um, but, you know, things like, you know, um, Oh, I'm thinking the little the little tubes, um, or or even I, I remember one of the things that uh, my son's occupational therapist um, made for him was she she bought two um, two of those uh, PVC pipe joints. You know the the little you know they look like little C's. Put them together to make a telephone for him, so that we were working on on processing um, auditory input and all that. Dude, that's at the hardware store. You know, um, so so a lot of different things that, that can be out there that I'll be honest, I totally overlooked when my son was was little. And, you know, so what I would say is learn from my mistakes. So any other questions before we finish today? We do have one that says that uh, Cynthia says that that's how we found out about school choice. We love that Indiana has that. We found a much better school for us because I found out about school choice through the autism center. Mm -hmm. And that is a wealth of information. Um, yeah. the, in the Indiana autism society is they're just a wealth of information too. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for, for having me today and, and for joining us. If you've got more questions, don't hesitate to, to reach out to us at the ARC. Um, we have um, all of our, everyone who works for the ARC advocacy network is either a parent a self-advocate or a sibling. So we all live this life. So if you've got questions, and, and one of the things that makes the ARC unique is that we cover the entire lifespan. So we're here when they're adults too. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out to InSource. They are an amazing wealth of information. So, you know, I, I am very lucky uh, that um, that I can call Jill and Lisa both friends um, and, and have a ton of respect for them. So, so reach out to your advocacy organizations because that's exactly what we're here for. Well, and thank you, Carly. Um, I have posted Carly's information in the chat box um, and also the, the, um, the Bureau of Developmental Disabilities information is there as well. Um, I do want to remind you that you will need to make sure that you either have followed in the chat box, I put, I've put the tiny URL for this um, webinar so that you would be able to have um, the resources and to be able to uh, complete the training survey and receive your certificate. And also you can use your uh, camera phone to use the QR code. But as of right now, I don't see any more questions. Um, so 
Carly, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I cannot tell you, it was definitely a wealth of information. Um, my son had uh, went through the waiver process and it actually took us 13 years. Um, so it's um, amazing how we know um, things are just changing for us. And uh, mm -hmm. um, it's just great. So um, at this time, if there's no more questions, this will end our webinar for everyone. I want to thank you again. And thank you, Carly. And everyone, please have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody.